Welcome to uh, the first installment of Some of Each. So um, tonight I'm going to read for, to you from um, some fiction and some poetry and a children's book on a um, broadly related theme. Uh, tonight it's going to be circus and it's possible I got a little over enthusiastic this evening and instead of coming to you in jeans and um, my sweatshirt I've been wearing all day. I have dressed um, inspired by the night circus which I'm going to read to you first and I've brought my friend Cirque um, who wanted in on the action. Uh, there's a little Cirque du Soleil going on in the background, so um, I'll read to you for about 20, maybe 30 minutes, and uh, hope you like it. So we're going to start out with one of my favorite novels of all time, which is The Night Circus by Erin Morgenstern, and um, read it to myself and loved it, and then read it out loud to um, Thomas, who also loved it, and um, I highly recommend it. Um, and I'm going to just read to you from the little prologue first. So, The Night Circus by Aaron Morgenstern. Anticipation. The circus arrives without warning. No announcements precede it. No paper notices on downtown posts and billboards. No mentions or advertisements in local newspapers. It is simply there, when yesterday it was not. The towering tents are striped in white and black no golds and crimsons to be seen. No color at all, save for the neighboring trees and the grass of the surrounding fields. Black and white stripes on gray sky, countless tents of varying shapes and sizes with an elaborate wrought iron fence encasing them in a colorless world. Even what little ground is visible from outside is black or white, painted or powdered or treated with some other circus trick. But it is not open for business, not just yet. Within hours, everyone in town has heard about it. By afternoon, the news has spread several towns over. Word of mouth is a more effective method of advertisement than typeset words and exclamation points on paper pamphlets or posters. It is impressive and unusual news, the sudden appearance of a mysterious circus. People marvel at the staggering height of the tallest tents. They stare at the clock that sits just inside the gates that no one can properly describe. And the black sign painted in white letters that hangs upon the gates, the one that reads, opens at nightfall, closes at dawn. What kind of circus is only open at night? People ask. No one has a proper answer. Yet, as dusk approaches, there is a substantial crowd of spectators gathering outside the gates. You are amongst them, of course. Your curiosity got the better of you, as curiosity is wont to do. You stand in the fading light, the scarf around your neck pulled up against the chilly evening breeze, waiting to see for yourself exactly what kind of circus only opens once the sun sets. The ticket booth, clearly visible behind the gates, is closed and barred. The tents are still, save for when they ripple ever so slightly in the wind. The only movement within the circus is the clock that ticks by the passing minutes, if such a wonder of sculpture can even be called a clock. The circus looks abandoned and empty, but you think perhaps you can smell caramel wafting through the evening breeze, beneath the crisp scent of the autumn leaves, a subtle sweetness at the edges of the cold. The sun disappears completely beyond the horizon, and the remaining luminosity shifts from dusk to twilight. The people around you are growing restless from waiting, a sea of shuffling feet, murmuring about abandoning the endeavor in search of someplace warmer to pass the evening. You yourself are debating departing when it happens. First, there is a popping sound. It is barely audible over the wind and conversation. A soft noise, like a kettle about to boil for tea. Then comes the light. All over the tents, small lights begin to flicker, as though the entirety of the circus is covered in particularly bright fireflies. The waiting crowd quiets as it watches this display of illumination. Someone near you gasps, 
a small child claps his hands with glee at the sight. When the tents are all aglow, sparkling against the night sky, the sign appears. Stretched across the top of the gates, hidden in curls of iron, more firefly-like lights flicker to life. They pop as they brighten, some accompanied by a shower of glowing white sparks and a bit of smoke. The people nearest to the gates take a few steps back. At first, it is only a random pattern of lights, but um, as more of them ignite, it becomes clear that they are aligned in scripted letters. First, a C is distinguishable, followed by more letters, a Q oddly, and several E's. When the final bulb pops alight and the smoke and sparks dissipate, it is finally legible. This elaborate incandescent sign. Leaning to your left to gain a better view, you can see that it reads Le Cirque des Rêves. Some in the crowd smile knowingly, while others frown and look questioningly at their neighbors. A child near you tugs on her mother's sleeve, begging to know what it says. The circus of dreams, comes the reply. The girl smiles delightedly. Then the iron gates shudder and unlock, seemingly by their own volition. They swing outward, inviting the crowd inside. Now the circus is open. Now you may enter. So that's the prologue to The Night Circus by Aaron Morgenstern, our fiction portion of the evening. Highly recommended. Um, I'm gonna read you some poems next from um, a couple of uh, poets that I like, and then I'll read you a couple of my own from my upcoming uh, manuscript that's gonna be out next year. So um, I'm gonna start with uh, this book called Congress of Strange People by Stephanie Lennox. And um, this book is uh, published by Airly Press, who's the same press that's going to be putting out my book next year. And um, so there's some very interesting things inside here. I'm going to read you um, three of these. The first one is called Minutes from the First Congress of Strange People. First order of business what to call this federation of freaks, our curious collective. Twisted exhibits, misfit menagerie, anatomical wonders, specimens of mistake and marvel, human superlatives, gorgeous mysteries, blessed monsters, employees of fate, noteworthy mutants, radical personas, nature's punchline, phantasms of distortion, chimeras and monarchs of the air, Famous and fortunate, lucis naturae, contortionists of the commonplace, sculptors of fear, quaint, queer, gruesome, and dazzling, beautiful beasts, bodily prodigies, ten in one, not alone loners. To be decided with your serpent tails and forked tongues, with your scaled arms, or with your nubbins, with the tiniest nod of your pin-shaped heads, with your illustrated flesh or albino eyes, with both sides of your split sex, with your feminine hirsuteness or monstrous bicep, remove the sword from your flaming throat and call out a new name. This is the other garden, our odd Eden, a tabula rasa of ludicrous acts. Hereby, we conclude the first meeting of the Congress of Strange People. Questions? Concerns? Thanks to the geeks for providing the hors d'oeuvres. Next meeting will be posted shortly. This record respectfully and remarkably submitted by Doug, self-elected secretary of armless wonder, who hears all and keeps the secrets, who accounts for everything with his mystifying, stupendous, articulate toes. All right, so that's uh, so again from the Congress of Strange People by Stephanie Lennox. This next poem is called The Amazing Cannonball Couple. I should have been a school teacher, she says, climbing into the cannon beside mine. Her helmet glitters and beneath it, she wags her flame retardant wig in mock regret. Shot out at 65 miles per hour, there's no sense in looking back. It could kill. 
Atop this keg of gunpowder, we await our cue. This must have been what we meant by better or worse, though I doubt we could have then imagined a sizamoid fractured five times twice dislocated shoulder, eyebrows singed, and penciled back for each night's performance. As long as our bodies bounce back, we've vowed to continue. We could have been anything. She's good at math. I've always liked geography. Each night, we collapse into sleep. Bodies propelled through dreams we'll never share. The ringmaster begs the audience for silence, and I know exactly how many seconds we have left. As the flame travels up the fuse, I hear her breathing steady and know her mind is focused on the moment of impact. What strength it takes to land just right so nothing breaks. Who would want lesson plans, small desks in rows after this? We've taught ourselves to fly and fall against nature to be both bird and stone. For a moment suspended above the crowd, two independent projectiles, one marvelous act. I'm gonna read you one more here again. Stephanie Lennox, Congress of Strange People. This one is called Shortest Woman Living. It starts with a little um, epigraph from the Guinness World Records. Madge Bester, South Africa, is just two feet, 1.5 inches tall. Sadly, she suffers from osteogenesis imperfecta, characterized by brittle bones and deformities of the skeleton. Tell me, what other way is there to suffer? My fragile bones attract the eye. There's no reason to feel sorry for me. 50 cents for all you can stand to look at. Twice as much to pick me up, carry me with you around the room. You must imagine me a foreshortened version of your own worn out body. It does hurt a little, but I'm the living one, different from other tiny skeletons stretching out at last in abbreviated coffins. I am listed between the shortest man and woman ever. When I die, my living title will be given away. I should be glad. The others too grew beyond their lives, nails, hair, and bones crowding their resting place. Someone once told me that grief fills a person the way gas fills a room, expanding to take any space it's given. My entry gives 34 words for what I must endure, my place in a painful world. Every day I open the book, bend back the spine and read, sadly, she suffers. Take these words into your mouth and carry their taste with you. I can't promise it will grow easier to bear. Stephanie Lennox, Congress of Strange People. Um, I love persona poems. My upcoming uh, manuscript called Daughters is also all persona poems. Um, so I'm going to give you uh, a couple more of those as well. So this next book is by my friend Shandel Beers, who's a, a wonderful poet who lives in Pendleton, Oregon. And this is her book, Sh Secure Your Own Mask. And what I like about these poems is that even though they're taking um, their imagery and um, inspiration from um, cir the circus, what's happening um, underneath is much bigger than that, and the emotional impact is much bigger than that, and I'm, I really like um, what she's done here with these poems. So this is called Self-Portrait as Rosenbach Writer. The arch of my foot is perfectly shaped to withers, to flank. I can stand in arabesque at a canter sweep my back leg through, back bend, walk over, and land astride. The hardest part is the smile, the unnatural strain on the face. It is the difficulty of beauty pageant smile during athletics. The Paso Fino beneath me flows like water. His walk is molasses. I give him molasses mixed with oats each night. He is sweet as sorghum. The clop-clop of his hooves is my heartbeat. Please pray the circus never separates us. This is the ringmaster's threat when the seats are empty. 
a horse costs so much to feed, and the lions are hungry. This is why I cry into the illustrated man's indigo skin every night. Um, this one again, Shandel Beers, Secure Your Own Mask. This one is called When We Were Knife Throwers. My favorite part of the act wasn't the sparkle of red sequins, the skimming of satin skirt flirting with thigh. I loved the knife thwack, the shudder of pearl handle vibrating when the blade landed true. I loved cartwheeling in space when you spun the wheel, our love every day a game of roulette, praying to always land on black, but wearing red just in case. I lived for you tying the blindfold, the whisper, I love you, as you fashioned the manacles secure. Each second, a precarious balance between trust and chance. Shandle beers, secure your own mask. So now I'm going to read you um, two poems from this has no cover yet. See, it's still in a notebook. Daughters. So this is my um, newest manuscript, and it's going to be out from Airly Press in uh, the fall of 2021. These are all persona poems, um, and they're all in the voices of daughters of various characters from mythology and folklore and popular culture and um, I wrote, I wrote one um, sort of on accident and then I kind of wrote another and at that point I decided it was going to be a series and then I did a whole book of them. So, um, but I, again, I love persona poems and one of the things I like about them is that they can make it um, in some ways easier to talk about material that's really difficult to get at, um, perhaps if you're writing um, in, in first person or in a confessional um, poem. Um, that material can sometimes be hard to confront and one of the things I do like about persona poems is that by inhabiting someone else you can sometimes approach that material um, in a different way um, and also be able to present it to your audience that way so I'm going to read you two from this um, and the first is magician's assistant's daughter this is about my childhood about how I was always made to sit in the wings, my mouth as still as if it had been stitched, as if I were enchanted into stone. About how I knew all his secrets, knew exactly what he did, knew and couldn't say, preserved the act. This is about how my mother was good at smiling, how when he handed her the slight flashy things on a hanger, when he made her put them on and twirl and raise her arms up in the air, everyone looking at the sparkle of her slender legs, she smiled like she deserved it. This is about how even when we thought it wasn't possible, there would be more of it. Scarf after scarf after scarf, the blacks and blues and yellows and reds of them erupting from his hands and also the birds, how they flew to the rafters, always came back. This is about how sometimes he would take off his hat, rotate it in slow hypnotic spins, show us the empty dark inside, show us there was nothing there, and then produce a rabbit from out the black, so soft, so calm and trusting, so white and pure and for us, we forgot about everything else. This is about the one trick that could almost unsteady her smile. The one where she climbed into the box, laid back her dazzling head, flexed and pointed her glitter bright feet. The one where he shut the lid, closed her in, dizzied her, readied the saw, and pulled her apart like a melon sliced in half. This is about how he put her back together, though I could see how she wobbled when she stood. I could hear her pleading through the applause. I could feel her eyes on me, witness the abracadabra of her heart, how it whispered to us, time to pierce the illusion, girl, time to vanish.
time to run. Alright, I'm gonna read you one more from Daughters. On our circus theme here. This is Lion Tamer's daughter. I was raised between the jaws of cats triple my size, teeth long as hairpins and paws that could pull down the sun. The straggle of their manes against the bars, the heat of their voices before the whip, cindered eyes on my father. At night, the panthers measure their cages, obsidian bodies seething in the dark, sleek throats a storm of guttural mewling as I fling them their meat, skim my fingers past their thrashing tails while they lick and swallow and tear. The tigers with their fur like Persian carpet, thick and persimmon bright, the fall of their stripes in undulations and ripples, the striding of their haunches and flanks. How the slender height of my father pins that power beneath their skins. How they pant. And the leopards with hides full of eyes, one spot after another backed onto each platform until they open their mouths at my father and fury tumbles out with fear. The crack of the whip against the earth of the arena the tension in the stands. But the lions, the caves of their maws, snouts snarled back around their dens of teeth. And my father, how he softens the whip in one hand, takes the thick tendrils of their manes within the other and lays his head upon their thrumming tongues. Each night, the big tent empty and the cats re-snared. I walk the ring of cages with my bucket of meat. Green eyes plead and threaten in the stench. I could unlock each latch, spring free each door. The cats would set upon me with gratitude and rage. One way or the other, they'd take me in. Well, those are from Daughters, again, coming out from Early Press next year. Um, and I'm going to end our evening with some um, children's lit here, a little children's book. I'm going to try to show you the pictures as we go. I know everything's sort of reversed, mirrored here, but hopefully um, in pictures it won't matter. So this is The Magic Rabbit by Annette LeBlanc Kate. Um, and Imogene today was telling me that she doesn't remember this book at all, even though we read it many, 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 many times. So um, maybe she'll watch and remember it again. So The Magic Rabbit. The Magic Rabbit. <laughs> Ray and Bunny lived together in a tiny apartment in the city. They were business partners. Ray was a magician, and Bunny was his loyal assistant. They were also best friends. They did everything together. Every Saturday, Ray and Bunny took their magic show downtown. But one Saturday, the sidewalk was a little more crowded than usual. And just as Ray said the magic word and Bunny was about to leap from the hat in a spray of glittering stars, Came a terrible tangle of balls and stars, juggler and magician, hat and bunny? Bunny, where are you? shouted Ray. The hat was empty. Bunny was gone. Meanwhile, the juggler's yipping pug was chasing Bunny down the sidewalk and right into the busy street. 
Car horns blared, bicycle bells rang, people shouted at the bunny, dodging in and out of traffic. At last, Bunny made it across. He was safe now. But where was Ray? All Bunny could see were legs and feet. Maybe if Bunny followed them, they would lead him back to Ray. The feet led him to a beautiful, cool green park. It was a wonderful place for a little bunny, full of squirrels to frolic with, and little bit of pretzel to nibble on, but no Ray. As the sunlight faded away, so did everyone else. Bunny was all alone. Bunny wandered along the dark street, thinking of Ray and wishing that they were settling down to dinner together right now at their own little table in the kitchen. All around him, people were hurrying home to their own dinners. No one stopped or even seemed to notice the lost little bunny. Bunny hopped along a little farther then slipped down a dark alley to rest. He was tired and hungry and missed Ray terribly. A tear rolled down his nose. His nose twitched. Then his nose twitched again. Bunny smelled something good to eat. It was popcorn, his favorite. Bunny got right to business. As he was nibbling, he noticed something shining among the kernels, glittering stars lots of them. Bunny followed the path of stars out of the alley, along the street, up a hill, down some stairs, and through the subway station all the way to his very own hat. The last train of the night pulled away. Only a magician and his bunny assistant were left on the platform. The two old friends Never mind walking home together. The end. Thank you all for joining me this evening. Uh, it was very fun. So I'm thinking I'll do this maybe once a week or so. Suggestions for the next theme, welcome. And um, each time there'll be a little fiction a little poetry, and I'm going to end with a children's book every time. So this again was The Magic Rabbit by Annette LeBlanc Kate, um, who also did the illustrations. Um, and if you liked any of these books tonight, which again, I'm going to show you again, The Night Circus by Erin Morgan Stern, Congress of Strange People by Stephanie Lennox, and Secure Your Own Mask by Shandel Beers, The Magic Rabbit. Um, I highly recommend um, that you support your local bookstores independent bookstores, order them online or for curbside pickup for those who are doing it and um, help support our bookstores uh, during this time. So um, get reading and I'll see you next time. Bye.